Hello. This week, the NHS turned 75, a moment of celebration, but also of trepidation over the state of our health service today. Record waiting lists, strikes, and a public losing confidence in a treasured institution, all painting a picture of a service struggling to cope and prompting a national conversation about where the NHS goes next. This week, I hear competing visions on the future of the NHS from the Health Secretary, Steve Barclay, plus his Labour counterpart, Wes Streeting. Can either political party really stick with the founding principles of the NHS to keep it a universal service, free at the point of delivery, funded by the state? Or does the NHS require radical change to endure for decades to come? Well, joining me in the studio to lay out Labour's plan for the future of the NHS is the Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeting. Wes, thanks for coming on the show today. Now, before we hear from Stephen Barclay, let me just get something straight with you. You criticised the government for the stewardship of the NHS, but can you give me an assurance that Labour won't wheel out that old attack line at the election that the Conservatives plan to privatise the NHS and therefore Labour are the ones to save it. Can we just rule that out now? Well, I hope the Tories rule out privatising the NHS. So I think there are, nonetheless, real signs of what I'd call a two-tier NHS in, in our country today, where those who can afford it are paying to go private because they know they're going to get seen faster. In fact, lots of them are sitting in NHS appointments being told, if you pay to go private, you'll get seen faster. And those who can't afford it are being left behind. And that's not the kind of health system I want for our country. But, but I get that. But just to be clear, you're, you know, the, the big 2019 attack from Jeremy Corbyn was they were going to plan, they were planning to privatise the NHS, the Conservative government. No, I think they're running, they're running it down. And but they, they've ruled, they've explicitly ruled it Yeah, I think they have. I think they have. I think they have. I think they have. You do accept that. I think they have. I, I, what, but what I would say is they are running the NHS down. We have got a a different form of privatisation by stealth, which is people now voting with their feet and with their wallets to go private because yeah. they don't think the NHS will be there for them when they need it. People in this country, West Street, are fair-minded. They know there was an unprecedented pandemic. They know we're in the middle of a cost-of-living crisis and high inflation is hurting public services and eroding their budgets. All of it play into the problems of the NHS. Isn't there a risk... Uh, that you look like you're trying to capitalise on circumstances that to some extent are beyond the government's control and, and the public will see that for what it is. Well, people are fair-minded and so am I. And any government would have had to grapple with the extraordinary challenges of the pandemic. But while we're fair-minded, we're not daft. There were 100,000 NHS staff vacancies before the pandemic, 112,000 vacancies in social care before the pandemic. So it isn't just that they didn't fix the roof while the sun was shining. They dismantled the roof, removed the floorboards, and the NHS and us as patients okay. was more dangerously exposed than we would otherwise have been. I'm going to, quite forensically, I hope, go through some of the plans uh, of the Labour Party. Uh, but before we do that, let's hear now from the Health Secretary, Steve Barclay, as he goes about defending the government's 13-year record on the NHS. Secretary of State, we are marking the 75th anniversary of the NHS being founded in 1948. By the time it hits its 100th anniversary, will we still have an NHS funded by taxpayers with treatment free at the point of use. We're committed to that and I think there's real opportunities and we put out uh, announcements on, for example, artificial intelligence, on early screening of lung cancer. But do you think it's sustainable, the model is sustainable free at the point of use? I think the NHS will need to evolve much more onto prevention rather than simply looking at treatment as we have the pressure of a growing older population, also people living with multiple conditions. One in four of the British public now have two or more conditions. Let's look at the state of the NHS today after 13 years of Conservative government. Have more people ever been waiting for NHS treatment than they are now? 
Well, we can see the impacts of the pandemic, Beth. I mean, if we take... I'm going to talk uh, well, to you about me, that in a moment, but, but have, let, ha, we well, haven't, if, have if we? If you just let me answer the question. So if, let me give you a practical example. Going into the pandemic, there was around 1,300 pa uh, patients waiting more than a year for their operation. At its peak, that increased mm. uh, to 410 thousand mm. but our plan on that is working but record waiters is it okay for people to wait in AA, a and e for over four hours no we don't want people waiting that's why we have a recovery plan it's why we're investing more the prime minister and you uh, when you talk about the problems in the nhs you always blame it on the pandemic and actually if you look at the record from 2010 no, I don't. I've just said it's to a 2023 it's not just the deficits in nhs trust became widespread by 2014 the nhs failed to hit he waiting time targets in 2014 and the following years that's the king's fund again from april 2023 so in 2014 six years before covid waiting targets were being missed i mean are you saying that this is a combination of austerity followed by cuts and then the pandemic that has put the nhs in the crisis it's now in no firstly i'm saying the pandemic has had a massive impact not just on the nhs in england but on the nhs in wales in scotland and actually when i talk with my counterparts on healthcare systems across the globe let's take elective treatment 92 percent of people waiting for elective treatment that's cataract surgery need replacements seen within 18 weeks from their referral when was that target last met so again, let's do you put know that... what I mean? I, well, this is not a it, gotcha question, but no, my let, point is, exactly. do you know when it so was last let's, met? Let's put it in context. So we have a plan in terms of elective recovery. That plan is working. Mr. Barclay, West, that target are... was not missed. That target was being missed in September 2015. My point is, it's not COVID. It's problems before COVID as well. You no can't... one is saying there weren't any challenges before the pandemic. Indeed, why the then Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister May, brought forward a long-term plan. You acknowledge that between 2010 and to up to Theresa May being Prime Minister, targets were missed, that a long-term plan comes in. Then we have the pandemic targets are missed, another long-term plan comes in. A&E for our targets were last met in 2015. Cancer care targets last met in 2015. Do you see the point I'm making here? Yes, and the point I'm making is things like the, the four-hour ANA target in Wales hasn't been met since 2009. And so, yes, of course, before the pandemic, there so were challenges. So that makes it OK, because Not Wales... Not at all, but your, your charge was this is, is down to... Well, you're the, the government the, running the indeed, NHS um, England, which serves millions and millions of us. What I'm trying to make the point to is just for you to be straight with people about austerity caused problems before, COVID has ex exacerbated that, those problems... And you don't seem to acknowledge that this is partly on the Conservative government, not just after the pandemic, but the way it was run for the past 13 years. Well, what I'm saying is there were always... You disagree with was... that. You don't think there were funding cuts. Uh, what I'm saying is we have... Inv Secretary of State, we are marking the 75th anniversary of the NHS being founded in 1948. By the time it hits its 100th anniversary, will we still have an NHS funded by taxpayers with treatment free at the point of use? We're committed to that and I think there's real opportunities and we put out uh, announcements on, for example, artificial intelligence, on early screening of lung cancer. But do you think it's sustainable, the model is sustainable free at the point of use? I think the NHS will need to evolve much more onto prevention rather than simply looking at treatment as we have the pressure of a growing older population, also people living with multiple conditions. One in four of the British public now have two or more conditions. Let's look at the state of the NHS today after 13 years of Conservative government. Have more people ever been waiting for NHS treatment than they are now? Well, we can see the impacts of the pandemic, Beth. I mean, if we take... I'm going to talk uh, well, to you about me, that in a moment, but, but have, ha, we well, haven't, if, have if, we? If you just let me answer the question. So if, let me give you a practical example. Going into the pandemic, there was around 1,300 pa uh, patients waiting more than a year for their operation. At its peak, that increased mm. uh, to 410 thousand mm. but our plan on that is working but record waiters is it okay for people to wait in a a and e for over four hours no we don't want people waiting that's why we have a recovery plan it's why we're investing more the prime minister and you uh, when you talk about the problems in the nhs you always blame it on the pandemic and actually if you look at the record from 2010 no, I don't. I've just said it's to a 2023 it's not just the deficits in nhs trust became widespread by 2014 the nhs failed to hit he waiting time targets in 2014 and the following years that's the king's fund again from april 2023 
So in 2014, six years before COVID, waiting targets were being missed. I mean, are you saying that this is a combination of austerity followed by cuts and then the pandemic that has put the NHS in the crisis it's now in? No, firstly, I'm saying the pandemic has had a massive impact, not just on the NHS in England, but on the NHS in Wales, in Scotland, and actually, when I talk with my counterparts, on healthcare systems across the globe. Let's take elective treatment. 92% of people waiting for elective treatment, that's cataract surgery, need replacements, seen within 18 weeks from their referral. When was that target last met? So, again, let's do you put know that... When, I mean, I, well, this is not it, a gotcha question, but no, my no, point is, exactly. do you know when it so was last let's, met? Let's put it in context. So we have a plan in terms of elective recovery. That plan is working. Mr Barclay, that we target are... was not missed. That target was being missed in September 2015. My point is, it's not COVID. It's problems before COVID as well. You no can't... one is saying there weren't any challenges before the pandemic. Indeed, why the then Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister May, brought forward a long-term plan. You acknowledge that between 2010 and to up to Theresa May being Prime Minister, targets were missed, that a long-term plan comes in. Then we have the pandemic targets are missed, another long-term plan comes in. A&E for our targets were last met in 2015. Cancer care targets last met in 2015. Do you see the point I'm making here? Yes, and the point I'm making is things like the, the four-hour ANA target in Wales hasn't been met since 2009. And so, yes, of course, before the pandemic, there so were challenges. So that makes it OK, because Not Wales... Not at all, but your, your charge was this is, is down to... Well, you're it, the, the government running the indeed, NHS um, England, which serves millions and millions of us. What I'm trying to make the point to is just for you to be straight with people about austerity caused problems before, COVID has exacerbated that, those problems. And you don't seem to acknowledge that this is partly on the Conservative government, not just after the pandemic, but the way it was run for the past 13 years. But well, what I'm saying is there were always... You disagree with that? You don't think there were funding cuts? Uh, what I'm saying is we have invested consistently in the NHS. I pointed to And I've investment. pointed stuff out from the King's well, Fund that says exactly the opposite. A public satisfaction chart that I've dug out, which I can show you if you want, shows public satisfaction plummeting in the NHS in 1997, 18 years after a Conservative government. And now in 2023, after 13 years of Conservative government, it's now back at a record high. Isn't the truth that the public think that you have failed them on the NHS? Well, the truth is that we've got the Does biggest ever... Does that not ever, worry you when I tell well, the, you that? The truth is we have the biggest ever investment in the NHS estate through over £20 billion going into our new hospitals programme. We have a historic Public investment. Dissatisfaction we have a historic investment. Well, if you let me answer the question. So we have well, you're not a answer, record, you're not acknowledging my question. We are investing record sums in the NHS estate. But at no point have you acknowledged... Uh, that funding cuts hit waiting lists up to 2020 and that has been exacerbated by the pandemic. And you might not want to say that to me for political reasons, but I think people who use the NHS feel it well, and then I've they feel that you're not acknowledging their no, truth. No, no. What I've acknowledged is there were pressure on waiting times going into the pandemic because we have an older population that in and turn had has and funding cuts. We're investing in our workforce in our NHS estate, in the latest technology. That is how we build a okay. sustainable NHS for the future. So keep the faith is your message to the public? Yes. OK, Secretary of State, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it, thank you. Secretary of State, we are marking the 75th anniversary of the NHS being founded in 1948. By the time it hits its 100th anniversary, will we still have an NHS funded by taxpayers with treatment free at the point of view. We're committed to that and I think there's real opportunities and we put out uh, announcements on, for example, artificial intelligence, on early screening of lung cancer. But do you think it's sustainable, the model is sustainable free at the point of view? I think the NHS will need to evolve much more onto prevention rather than simply looking at treatment as we have the pressure of a growing older population, also people living with multiple conditions. One in four of the British public now have two or more conditions. Let's look at the state of the NHS today after 13 years of Conservative government. Have more people ever been waiting for NHS treatment than they are now? Well, we can see the impacts of the pandemic, Beth. I mean, if we take... I'm going to talk uh, well, to you about me, that in a moment, but, but have, let, ha, we well, haven't, if, have if we? If you just let me answer the question. So if, let me give you a practical example. Going into the pandemic, there was around 1,300 pa uh, patients waiting more than a year for their operation. At its peak, that increased mm. uh, to 410,000. Mm. But our plan on that 
is working. But record waiters, is it OK for people to wait in A&E for over four hours? No, we don't want people waiting. That's why we have a recovery plan. It's why we're investing more. The Prime Minister and you, uh, when you talk about the problems in the NHS, you always blame it on the pandemic. And actually, if you look at the record from 2010 no, I don't. I've just said it's to 2023, it's not just the deficits in NHS trusts became widespread by 2014. The NHS failed to hit heat waiting time targets in 2014 and the following years. That's the King's Fund, again, from April 2023. So in 2014, six years before COVID, waiting targets were being missed. I mean, are you saying that this is a combination of austerity followed by cuts and then the pandemic that has put the NHS in the crisis it's now in? No, firstly, I'm saying the pandemic has had a massive impact, not just on the NHS in England, but on the NHS in Wales, in Scotland, and actually, when I talk with my counterparts, on healthcare systems across the globe. Let's take elective treatment. 92% of people waiting for elective treatment, that's cataract surgery, need replacements, seen within 18 weeks from their referral. When was that target last met? So, again, let's do you put know that... When, I mean, I, well, this is not it, a gotcha question, but no, my let, point is, exactly. do you know when it so was last let's, met? Let's put it in context. So we have a plan in terms of elective recovery. That plan is working. Mr Barclay, West, that target are... was not missed. That target was being missed in September 2015. My point is, it's not COVID. It's problems before COVID as well. You no can't... one is saying there weren't any challenges before the pandemic. Indeed, why the then Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister May, brought forward a long-term plan. You acknowledge that between 2010 and up to Theresa May being Prime Minister, targets were missed, that a long-term plan comes in. Then we have the pandemic targets are missed, another long-term plan comes in. A&E four-hour targets were last met in 2015. Cancer care targets last met in 2015. Do you see the point I'm making here? Yes, and the point I'm making is things like the, the four-hour A&E target in Wales hasn't been met since 2009. And so, yes, of course, before the pandemic, there so were challenges. So that makes it OK, because Not Wales... Not at all, but your, your yeah, charge was this is, is down to... Well, you're the, the government the, running the indeed, NHS um, England, which serves millions and millions of us. What I'm trying to make the point to is just for you to be straight with people about austerity caused problems before, COVID has ex exacerbated that, those problems, and you don't seem to acknowledge that this is partly on the Conservative government, not just after the pandemic, but the way it was run for the past 13 years. But well, what I'm saying is there were always... You disagree always, with that? You don't think there were funding cuts? Uh, what I'm saying is we have invested consistently in the NHS, I pointed to and I've investment. pointed stuff out from the King's well, Fund that says exactly the opposite. A public satisfaction chart that I've dug out, which I can show you if you want, shows public satisfaction plummeting in the NHS in 1997, 18 years after a Conservative government. And now in 2023, after 13 years of Conservative government, it's now back at a record high. Isn't the truth that the public think that you have failed them on the NHS? Well, the truth is that we've got the Does biggest ever... Does that not ever, worry you when I tell well, the, you that? The truth is we have the biggest ever investment in the NHS estate through over £20 billion going into our new hospitals programme. We have a historic Public investment. Dissatisfaction we have a, a historic investment. Well, if you let me answer the question. So we have well, you're not a answer, record... But you're not acknowledging my question. We are investing record sums in the NHS estate. But at no point have you acknowledged... Uh, that funding cuts hit waiting lists up to 2020 and that has been exacerbated by the pandemic. And you might not want to say that to me for political reasons, but I think people who use the NHS feel it well, and then I've they feel that you're not acknowledging their no, truth. No, no. What I've acknowledged is there were pressure on waiting times going into the pandemic because we have an older population that in and had austerity has and funding cuts. We're investing in our workforce in our NHS estate, in the latest technology. That is how we build a sustainable okay. NHS for the future. So keep the faith is your message to the public? Yes. OK, Secretary of State, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it, thank you. Focused on delivering a neighbourhood health service, bringing the NHS into the community. How does that work? Well, I think a number of ways. I mean, it's partly about recruiting more GPs. It's also about making better use of community pharmacy. It's about new services like community mental health hubs. And it's about, I think, cutting out some of the bureaucracy and red mm. tape that patients and professionals are encountering. Mm. And so that's what I mean by fixing the front door to the NHS. And that's why, Beth, mm. uh, you know, not to labour the point about the money again, there are examples of how I'm money gonna... is not well spent. So... And we've got to, if we're going to ask for more money, we've got to deal with those examples of waste. A big expansion there of, of, of community care. Now, you made this reform speech at the King's Fund 
and they assessed the plans themselves. And they said, this is April 2023, there's been a clear consensus for more than 30 years under successive governments that moving care from hospitals to communities is the right thing to do. So far, so good. Uh, and then they went on. Previous attempts to do this have failed spectacularly. Translating these warm words into tangible change for all patients will require radical reform across the whole health and care system, from social care to fully engage in the voluntary se sector to improve in NHS buildings. I agree. Now, but it, it's quietly damning this in a way, Wes, because for this to work, you need social care reform, you need investment in NHS buildings, and you're no closer to a fundamental expensive reform of social care than the current government. The Same King's the Fund say have done. that you need social care reform and that you need to improve NHS buildings. Yeah, and we're up for it. We're going to be really busy if we win the next general election. We're but ambitious the, for the, the NHS the, and we recognise it's going to take time. But the point and is... And we recognise it's going to take reform. But the point is, I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is, the point is, is both of those need some sort of funding commitments. Yeah, look, we know that this so, isn't going to so be easy. So the plan ain't going to work? No, we know it's not going to be easy. Oh, it's going to work a bit, but we not all We know it's not it. going to be easy. And as with the last Labour government, as the economy grows, there will be money to invest in our public services, which is why economic growth is our number one objective. Now, can you pledge that Labour will go into the election with a policy on adult social care, despite the political toxicity of this subject? You won't, will you? We will, but one thing I'm determined to do around social care is avoid where... We have been, and when I say we, I mean we uh, in politics, the main political parties, for more than a decade now, mm. of going into every election, shooting down each other's ideas mm. and hamstringing social care so reform and, ser and service change. But what I'm not going to do is, is have mm. social care as a political okay. football at this election because Just, I think we've been there before. You know, let you down say that we keep going around the, the houses, though. The acknowledgement in all of this as we, we unpick a bit about kind of which bits you can and can't do is that you, you seem to be acknowledging here um, that some of the reforms that Labour would want to, to make if it was in government, in power, you're going to have to backload them to the end of a parliament or even hope for a second term because you won't have uh, the money in the public coffers uh, to fund some of the uh, projects and programmes and policy reforms that will be needed. Is that fair? Well, some of which, some of it we can get our skates on pretty quickly, actually, in terms it's, of, it's, in terms of, true, in, though, terms of short, well, in terms of short term uh, fixes, in terms of uh, you know, using the private sector to bring down NHS waiting lists and allowing people to do that free at the point of use. That capacity is there. Yeah. We can make better but, use but of you, it. Do you see my bigger point? Do you acknowledge that, that because of... Well, not, enti not entirely, Beth, in that, you know, on workforce, for example, we can get our skates on. In fact, one of the reasons I... I'm not talking I, about workforce. I'm, I'm talking about social care. But, it's and, it's and, also, but it is also fundamental to everything else. Look, I, I accept that whether it's the NHS or other areas of public policy, there are some things either we'd like to do in the first term but won't be able to, or some things that we would like to do faster but won't be able to afford. But that means that when people pick up a Labour manifesto and they see the promises and the pledges in it, they can have greater confidence that okay. every promise is one that so we can keep and one we can afford, okay. because to get into the manifesto, as I think people have seen in our interaction, it's a high bar. There is an issue of trust and credibility here. Uh, Keir Starmer made 10 pledges to the Labour Party when asking to become party leader. They included point five, which said these words, end outsourcing in our NHS. What did you take to mean, those words to mean? Well, I think that, what Keir wants to achieve and what I want to achieve is better value for taxpayers' money. And sometimes I think it is fair to say um, outsourcing, although notionally about cost saving, is penny wise and pound foolish. And what I would say more generally about the pledges that... What do you take as outsourcing? Well, I mean, there are lots when of... When he said end of... outsourcing, didn't he mean end private provision Well, I'll, I'll, give, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. That's, that's what well, he's getting I'll, no, I'll give you an example. Is that what we, he's get, that, uh, That's what it was well, hang on, at, I, I, isn't it? Well, I don't think it said that. I'll just say one more thing about Keir's 10 pledges and the issue of trust, which is that when he made those pledges, the world was yet to change with the pandemic 
and with the absolute state of the public finances. And I hope that people take trust and confidence from the fact that we are not going into the next election making promises that we can't keep, that things that we might like to have done, we've had to quite honestly say we're not going to be able okay. to afford to do. A lot of uh, Labour supporters, Labour members will have maybe been shouting at the television when you said that because a lot of them will feel that the reason that Keir Starmer made these pledges or a number of them was because he's trying to win the leadership on the back of quite a left-leaning membership and he said what he needed to say to win and then he changed what he did and a number of uh, Labour supporters might feel betrayed by that. I, I think that's a serious misrepresentation of the mood of the Labour membership. No one in the Labour Party is feeling betrayed by a leader who has put Labour within touching distance of winning the next general election. There are people who's on the Labour left worst... that will feel betrayed well, I'm sorry, by, but they by have promises to, they, he um, made they to have become to, well, leader I'm they, and, they have and, to, and then he's backed off Well, from them. I'm afraid they have to dry their eyes and be glad of the fact that we might finally, after 13 years, get this Conservative government out and have a Labour government able to change our country once again. John McDonald was on television on Newsnight with an interview with Nick Watt, the political editor there, saying that uh, Keir Starmer is drunk on power. Well, not in power. I, I don't know he's if drunk on the power he has, <laughs> don't people... and he's ignoring just, sections of the party. I, I, I just, I, to be honest, I thought that was extraordinary. I thought it was extraordinary because what Keir has done is take the Labour Party from its worst defeat since 1935, when we weren't trusted on a whole range of issues, and where people had been bullied and hounded out of the Labour Party, not least through the issue of anti-Semitism, and he has taken that absolute shipwreck that the Labour Party was in 2019, and now made it seaworthy, and I hope on course for a general election victory. On the substance, you've, you've made it clear you're happy to use private um, sector to increase capacity. You talked about that, about it driving yeah. down waiting lists. Tony Blair's called for an expansion of the private sector's role in the NHS in the digital era. Would you like to see their involvement grow? I don't agree with what Tony Blair said today. So I think he's talked about people having individual health accounts with a that's budget it. they can spend in the private sector. I think that's a step too far, actually. I don't support that. Uh, and similarly, I don't support what lots of Conservatives have been saying about charging people to see a GP and expanding user charging in the NHS. I'm completely opposed to that. I believe in an NHS that's publicly funded, free at the point of use, there for us when we need it. Thank you so much uh, for joining me today. That was a fascinating Thank conversation. You very much. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed this week's conversations with Labour's Wes Streeton and the Health Secretary, Steve Barclay. Plenty of food for thought in both of them. Now, if you scan the QR code on the left of your screen, you can watch all of our previous episodes online. And if you scan this QR code on your screen right now, you can listen to the Beth Rigby Interviews podcast. Each week, I take a look at the highlights of the interviews and there are some extra bits and pieces in there too. That's on the Sky News app or wherever you get your podcasts. Well, that's all for this week's show. Thank you so much for watching.